This is the Mark Dolan Way. Top tips for mind, body and soul, some great life hacks and my favourite products of the week. This show is available on all podcast platforms or you can watch it. Just subscribe to the Mark Dolan Way on YouTube and join the Facebook group. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the show. I hope you're very well. Two words that will change your life. Move on. Any problems you've had at work or in relationships or in your life, they are in the past. They're behind you. It's out of your control. You accept it and you move on. A good metaphor is football. And if you observe certain teams that are losing a game with the wrong mentality, those players carry that failure. You can see it in their body language and they are guaranteed to lose the game at full time. But if you look at excellent athletes with a great positive mentality, so let's take a footballer like Harry Kane. If Harry Kane, who plays for England and Spurs, if he misses the opportunity to score or if he misses a penalty, obviously at that moment he's devastated and he, and he cups his head in his hands. But seconds later, when they put the ball back uh, in the middle of the pitch and start the game again, he moves on. He's ready for the next opportunity. But you'll see players, others have been destroyed by the fact that they could have scored, but they didn't and they missed. And now they just carry that around for the rest of the game, guaranteeing failure. So winners always move on. Now, let me tell you, I'm very excited about, well, there's so much to talk to you about. Should we get straight in with my product of the week? And it is Wool detergents. I'm absolutely buzzing about this. So um, can we just talk about detergent? Detergent is very bad for the environment. Most detergents are ridiculously strong and astringent and ridiculously over crazily chemical and too clean. So you have biological washing powder and it contains enzymes which chew up stains and fat and dirt and all the rest of it. But the bottom line is that I can tell you every time you do a wash, you are blitzing your clothes. You are stripping your clothes of their natural fibers and it's really bad for them and they will get old. So if you're using these really tough detergents and these would be like the mainstream detergents you get in a supermarket, the biological and even the non-bio, um, they, they are stripping, they are depleting your clothes. Your clothes are made of fibres. So if it's polyester, that's a man-made fibre. If it's cotton or if it's wool, of course, those are natural. And they're not designed to be blitzed in this way. And they don't need it. They do not need it. You don't have to go for these hardcore detergents. And the problem is that they will affect your skin. You know, if you've been washing clothes in these strong detergents, biological detergents with bleach and all the rest of it, that's going on your skin. Yes, it might have been rinsed and dried, but it remains as a residue on the fibre of the clothes and that goes straight on your skin. Do you want that? And imagine like, for example, with sport, if you are sweating into the clothes that have been washed in these very, very tough detergents, that's going to enter, that's going to enter your body. So you don't want it. So these, all these detergents are really unnatural, not good for your skin. You're also breathing in these strong fragrances and perfumes. Is that good for you? I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I can't imagine it's brilliant. Um, and, and as I say, also, if you're washing your clothes, so let's say shirts, for example, I used to wash my shirts in these tough detergents and I just noticed they didn't last. You know, they would start to get you know, frayed at the edges or even ripped. Why? Because they've been depleted. They've been stripped. So don't do it. I highly recommend that you use wool detergent. So you go to your local supermarket and you just find a washing powder, which is for wool and silk only. Now, there are different brands here in the UK. We have a brand called Woolite, W-O-O-L-I-T-E, an excellent brand. But any detergent that's designed to wash wool will do the job. And here's the thing. It washes all clothes. So the wool detergent is great on your shirts. It's great on your jeans. And all it is really is basically soap. It's liquid soap. So it's a very traditional, very natural, no enzymes. And of course, when it goes out of the washing machine into the waste pipe and when it goes out of your home, 
it's not going to kill as many fishes. So it's better for the environment. So there you go, wool detergent, highly recommended. And what you'll find is your clothes just last so much longer. They preserve their color. Because don't forget, I mean, have you never bought a new pair of jeans or a new shirt, washed them in the regular detergent and found that they've lost their color after the very first wash? The very first wash, they're not the same, are they? They are not the same. And you've already fallen slightly out of love with this item of clothing after its first wash. Devastating. That won't happen with a wool detergent. It will change your life. I love it. I promise you, it's just it's just brilliant. And the thing is, you know, what is a detergent there to do? It's there to wash out, you know, sweat and things like that, you know, because you, you sweat under your arms, don't you? And that the wool detergent will absolutely do that. It's not a problem. That, of course, that's how they sell you is that the regular detergents are really tough on stains and stuff like that. Well, this takes me to my next point, which is, yes, if you've got a white shirt and it's got a coffee stain on it, you probably will need to use one of the tough detergents. So I always keep in, in this country, we have Ariel. There's also Purcell, right? They're hardcore. And yes, for my white shirts, if there's a stain, then I will use the hardcore stuff, it will get it out. But as a general rule, my shirts are just dirty. They're just a bit smelly and they need to be washed and cleaned. You don't need stain removal for that. So there you go, highly recommended. So to be clear, the wool detergent won't be amazing on stains, but how often do you get really bad stains? And also give it a try because you'll be surprised. It's amazing what you can actually remove with a wool detergent. Um, so ketchup would be fine. Mud, not a problem. The other thing you can do, by the way, if you're worried about either your clothes still not being clean or uh, stains, just increase the temperature by 10 degrees. So go from 40 to 50, things like that. If I've got really dirty stuff, let's say the kids have been playing football and there's grass stains. We, I still use the wool detergent, but I'll put it on 60. And that normally blitzes it. But I'd rather have hot water than these chemicals destroying my clothes. Uh, it takes me to my next point, by the way, which is, let's say you've got some a stain on your, on your shirt. Unless it's massively visible, who cares? Stop being so perfect. Let your clothes have a stain. Uh, maybe your jeans are slightly ripped. That's OK. They're ripped. Who cares? I haven't ironed my shirt today and here I am broadcasting to the world. It's OK. I'm not going to get arrested, am I? Who's going to arrest me? It's not a crime. So take some pressure off yourself. Live with imperfection. Embrace imperfection because it will save you time. It will save you a lot of mental stress. I mean, yeah, if you've got time to iron your shirt, if you've got time to remove that stain, if you've got time for this, you've got time for that. No problem. Otherwise, keep it simple. Um, it's the same with at home, I've got wooden floors. Now, in an ideal world, I would be cleaning those thoroughly every few days. Ah, but what I wind up doing, I do nothing. I don't clean them at all. And I find that with wooden floors, the dust and the dirt, it seems to just shift to the edge of the room. So all I'll do once a week or maybe once every 10 days, I just go around the edge of the room on the floor with a damp cloth and I can just literally collect up all the dust that has gathered. Simples. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Live with imperfection. Um, the best thing, the greatest gift that can happen to you, you know, when you own something, like if you've ever bought a new car or you bought a secondhand car that was in mint condition, because normally when they sell secondhand cars, they they get the, the body kind of like the bodywork all cleaned up, don't they? So it looks good. You're always devastated when it gets its first scratch or its first dent. Isn't it the end of the world? Brand new car, first scratch. Oh my God, disaster. Well, no, embrace it. It is a gift. The first scratch on your car liberates you. You are free. That perfect new car is now scratched. It's human. It's subject to reality. It is, it is, uh, you know, it is a thing. It's real because life ain't perfect. So welcome that first scratch, the first dent on your brand new car. Don't get it fixed. It's a badge of honor. I got my Prius, my lovely Prius, I got to say it's beaten up as hell. It, it's about 12 years old and it's been to hell and back. It's traumatized. Um, and just recently a bus 
crashed into the side of it. Whilst it was parked, I wasn't there, but a very nice lady left me a note on my car saying, a 46 bus in Hampstead High Street has just basically scraped the size of your side of your car. So she said she heard this crumpling sound. She came out and she watched the bus kind of brush past the Prius. All right. Now, the good news is I couldn't care less because the car's 12 years old and it's got scratches already. So I'm free. I was liberated with the first scratch all those years ago when I purchased it from Toyota. And I looked at this. I looked at the damage from the bus and Basically, it didn't it doesn't affect the structural integrity of the car. It was it was at the front wheel arch on the right hand side, the passenger side. And it's just a little bit of a dent and a red, a red scar, like a red mark from the red of the bus. My car's black. There's a red stripe on there, but it doesn't affect the car's safety or ability to function. It doesn't look that bad. The car's got other scratches anyway. Who cares? If I was going to pursue an insurance claim, which I could have against this driver because it was his fault and this nice lady was going to be my witness. So I could have pursued it through insurance. But what happens with insurance is that even if it's not your fault, it still goes down as a claim and therefore will increase your premiums the following year. That's so unfair, isn't it? But that's how it works. And therefore, it ain't worth it. Not for a car of that low value like mine. So I I didn't bother. And also, here's the other thing. I just thought, who cares? You know, in some ways, this this little bit of red on the car, it's it's a story, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? It's it's uh, it's a moment in my life. And, you know, I feel I feel that the bus has has just blessed my car with uh, with an experience, an interesting experience of being crashed into. So embrace imperfection. It ties in with move on, doesn't it? Your car's been scratched. You're a bit disappointed. Move on. But not just that. If bad stuff happens, welcome it. Embrace it. It's great when bad things happen because it's a gigantic opportunity to just move on, accept it and go whatever. Remember, go back to that footballer that misses a penalty and they could just carry that around with them for the rest of the game. But the good ones don't. They move on. The guy missed the penalty. Who cares? Let's get the next penalty. Let's get the next goal. They've moved on. And the others, the shoulders drop, the head drops, sad eyes, depressed. They're guaranteeing failure. So bad things happen. That is the basis for success. That is the basis for a happy life. You just move on. You're out of there. You've just onwards and upwards. It's a little bit like, do you remember? Have you seen Terminator 2, which is a fantastic science fiction film? And you've got this um, really evil robot cop. And when Arnold Schwarzenegger, as the Terminator, shoots him, the bullet goes into this electronic robot cop. And basically the bullet goes into him and it kind of melts and then just drips off his body and he carries on. He's impervious to the bullets. Well, why don't you be like that? Be, be like the robot cop in Terminator 2. You just you are literally walking into the line of fire and bullets are coming in your direction. You're just shrugging them off one after the other. Setback, failure. The boss has had a go at you. Um, your figures, your, 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 your professional numbers are not happening at the moment. Your sales targets down. It's all terrible. Not a problem. I'm getting straight back up and I'm going to go again. I've been amazingly unsuccessful, but I just wake up in the morning, I get a coffee in me and we go again and we live with failure and we live with imperfection and we live with a scratched car or a Prius that's been demolished by a 46 bus in Hampstead High Street. And we just crack right on going, bring it on. Crash into the other side of the car if you want to, because I've got this because I have a superpower. And that superpower is the ability in two words to move on. Unbelievable. Uh, Take responsibility. Own it. Oh, my God. I cannot tell you what another superpower this is. This this show should be called The Superpower Show because all of the things that I'm sharing with you are superpowers. What is a superpower? Superpower is really just a power that others don't have. The truth is that everyone's got these superpowers, but they don't deploy them. And that's what this podcast, this show is all about. So the the the, um, another it's another two word superpower, which is take responsibility. It is an absolute game changer if you do 
one thing in your life, which is to take responsibility. Now, what that means is that if you've made a mistake or if you failed in some way, you own it. And this will create massive respect among your colleagues, your friends and your loved ones. So I worked with a colleague recently. He made a massive mistake on my show and it made the show look bad. And it was awkward for me because when you're presenting a show, you're the idiot. You're the one that carries the can. I was not happy. We go into an ad break and I said, hey, let's call him Bobby. I said, Bobby, his real name is Steve. But I said, Bobby, um, that was really bad. That was a massive mistake. And the show looked really bad and the viewers will not be impressed. And he said, yeah, my mistake. Uh, I should have done that earlier and I didn't. I completely forgot. Really sorry. Oh, my God. This guy goes from zero to hero. He's made a massive mistake. He has damaged the show, but he has owned it. He didn't say, oh, it's Debbie's fault or it's um, Raymond's fault or uh, Barry. No, 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 no. He took it. Bobby, it's my fault. He owned it. He went up in my estimation and there is somebody I can trust because I can trust anyone that makes mistakes. I can't trust anyone that doesn't take responsibility. If you make a mistake, own it. It's a sign of confidence to tell others, I messed up. This was me. It was nobody else. And you will find that people that take responsibility tend to be the much more successful people in life. Your word is your credibility. Every single human being is a brand. And in the commercial world, brands earn trust over time by delivering for their customers. Let's say the Holiday Inn is somewhere where you just always get a good night's sleep, the great cooked breakfast in the morning. Perhaps it is Nike running shoes. You know, you never get an injury. They're comfortable. They look great. Maybe it's a Mercedes Benz, right? They don't break down. Aesthetically beautiful, built without compromise. And perhaps you had an accident in Mercedes and no one was hurt because it was so safe. Trust is earned. Well, you're a brand too. So make sure that you are truthful with people. Never lie. Never lie. If you lie, you have to have a good memory and no one's memory is that good. Secondly, it's very hurtful to lie to someone. If they found out, if they find out they've been lied to, that hurts. Okay. Do you want to hurt people? No. You're also hurting yourself because you're damaging your brand. You're damaging your reputation. You're damaging your the perception that others have of you. Okay. So always truthful. Ties in with taking responsibility. So if a mistake happens at work, if you step in and go, I did it, people will honestly, their estimation of you will skyrocket as opposed to lying and say, oh, I wasn't there then, that didn't happen on my watch. And then they've got the CCTV, they watch it back and you were there. That's it. You're gone. You're over. You are out of there. Even if you stay in the in the company, the trust is gone. The same with a partner. If you're unfaithful and you're going to sleep with someone else, even if they forgive you, the damage is done. Your brand has been impacted. So don't do it. Don't be, you know, don't, don't be duplicitous. Don't be dishonest. Don't be shifty. Be really straight with people and let your word be your bond. So if you say, I will be there at three o'clock, be there at three. And if you're late, do you know what you do? You take responsibility and you say, I'm really sorry I was late. Uh, it wasn't the traffic. It wasn't the alarm clock. I messed up again. Amazing. You become a hero. He was late and he just said he was late because he messed up because he was just too slow leaving the house as opposed to oh, I was late because of this. I was late because of that. No, forget that. Straight in with people. Being honest, being straight is another superpower. Um, and so, yeah, your word is your credibility. And let me tell you. This is an essential point which you must not forget. Everything in life is messaging. So all of your actions, all of your behavior and everything you say is a message to the people around you, your colleagues, your loved ones and the outside world. Perfect example, lateness. Why is lateness a problem? Well, because it's inconvenient for the others who are waiting for you so they can't start the meeting. Or if you're meeting a loved one and you're going to the cinema, maybe they're going to miss the trailers, which is, as we all know, the best bit of going to the cinema. But essentially, of course, it's impractical and annoying if others are late, but it's much worse than that. The 
problem with lateness is the messaging. And the message, if you're late, is that the person you're meeting doesn't matter. Now, that may not be what you think. It could be that you really value that person and respect the person that you're meeting. You might look up to them. They, they could be somebody that in your mind's eye is superior to you. But by being late, you're putting them under a pedestal. You're disrespecting them and you're telling them they're not important. How damaging is that to your brand in their eyes, to your reputation? It's a disaster. So everything is messaging. If you get to, let's say, a meeting or social engagement early, it's the opposite messaging. You're telling them that they're really important. So let's say you've got a work meeting at three and you get there at 2.45. The messaging is they matter, that you've just upgraded them to a really important person. If you get there half an hour early, they're even more important. If you get there an hour early, if you get there two hours early and they say, why are you here so early? You can say, well, I wanted to prep for our very important meeting at two. I want to be ready for you. Oh my God, their heads will fall off. You're a rock star. You're unbelievable. As opposed to 10 minutes late in a hot sweat, blaming the bus. Do you see? Everything is messaging. That's why sending someone a card or a text on their birthday, it doesn't take much effort, does it, to text someone saying, uh, hey, Andrea, happy birthday. Now, that's just a text. Why does that make a difference? Because the messaging tells Andrea that you've been thinking of her, that she's on your mind and that you want to acknowledge her special day because I mean, people's birthday, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I find birthdays bloody annoying and it's a hassle and it's a drag. And I've annoyed many people in the past by forgetting their birthday or not acknowledging it. Now, in my defense, it's because I don't care about mine. So I don't need, I, I don't really expect people to message me on my birthday. It just isn't a story for me. In fact, I definitely don't understand why people go on media, social media and say that it's their birthday. What's that all about announcing to the world it's your birthday? I would never do that. I couldn't care less. I don't need everyone at work or anyone at work to sing happy birthday or anything. But um, I've just accepted that it really matters to everyone else. Almost everyone. So I've accepted that it's important. And why? I guess because it's messaging. If you, you know, it's their special day. It's the day that they arrived on Earth. So it is important to them. And it is important, full stop, actually. And I probably should take other people's birthdays more seriously. And although I don't care about birthdays, I've made an effort because I understand that the messaging matters. OK, and there's some people in my life who I love and I want them to know that I've made the effort to wish them a happy birthday. So even a text, it means that you're saying it, it's not the text. They don't need to read a text that says happy birthday. But what they needed is the messaging that you were thinking about them on their special day. And it's amazing. So it's it's like being early for the meeting. The messaging is really like, wow, I got I got a message from, uh, you know, let's say I got a message from Muhammad. Right. I haven't seen I went to university with Muhammad. I haven't seen him uh, for years. But every every time it's my birthday, every year he texts me on my birthday and he remembers me. And that really, really touches me. And I, I maybe should see Muhammad and we should meet up again. And he's clearly somebody that's of great value in my life. He's, he's, he's somebody that's uh, in my tribe. You know, he's my, he's in, he's in my circle of trust. In a future show, we'll talk about building your own tribe, by the way, people who are like-minded, who share your values and who are, um, who are looking out for your best interests and vice versa. But yeah, so whatever it is, perhaps it's a, uh, let me tell you, Christmas day, my wonderful, beautiful mother-in-law, um, we we go to church. She's not wildly religious, but she's Catholic. <clears throat> we go to church on Christmas Day and I wear a tie for church. I don't need to wear a tie. I think she appreciates it that her son-in-law is wearing a tie in the church. I'm, I'm there. I'm with her beautiful daughter. I'm representing the family. I'm wearing a tie. I'm doing it as a mark of respect to her the, the messaging is that we're in church and this is important. This is valuable and spiritual to her. And I do it. I'm showing respect. And it's a lovely thing. I mean, don't go too far, by the way. You don't have to, like, you know, 
bow and scrape to people. Don't make yourself too small in order to have positive messaging, you know. So you still got to assert your own needs, your own ego, your own best interests. But just have a think about that. It's like a job interview, isn't it? For the job interview, are you on time? Are you well dressed? It's all messaging. When you go to court, when people go to court, they, they wear a suit. Why? Because they want to send a message to the judge that they take this seriously. Uh, if it was a crime they were guilty of, they're really sorry and they can hopefully get a shorter sentence or they want to be taken seriously to defend the fact that they didn't do the crime. Again, they're not going to achieve that in a pair of shorts, a T-shirt and a set of flip flops. OK, nothing good was ever achieved in flip flops. By the way, how absolutely disgraceful are flip flops? Aren't they the worst thing ever? I, I cannot walk in flip flops. Can you walk in flip flops? I think they're an, a catastrophic disaster. You know, there's a certain number of people that die every year because they get run over by somebody driving a car wearing flip flops. I'm not sure that if you're wearing flip flops and you're in a car crash, the insurers should really pay out because it is, neg it is negligent, isn't it? It is negligent to wear flip flops. I find them horrific. And. My son was running down a hill once in flip-flops, tripped, disaster. Chaos ensued. Horrible. I do not. I'm against flip-flops. And I think that there should be legislation through national parliaments to end them. I don't think they look good. I don't want to see people's nails. I don't want to see that much foot. Let's be honest. There is no foot that's beautiful, is there? Kate Moss, the world's most famous supermodel. Fabulous, beautiful lady. I don't want to see the feet. She'll have bad feet. No one's got good feet. Feet are uh, notoriously ugly. And the flip flop is there to present the foot as some kind of amazing aesthetic triumph. Thanks, but no thanks. Bunions, fungal nails, blisters. Ugh. Have you ever seen a good set of feet? No way. The only you have children, great feet. But grown adults, the feet are always a complete disaster. And uh, I don't want to see the feet. That's the flip flop. I'm not having it at all. Um, I'm a size 11, which uh, is a UK 11. Isn't it confusing? Couldn't the world just decide on one size of shoe? Is that too much to ask? Please. In this globalized world, couldn't we just have a standard measurement of size? Because I've got to work out. I've got to go in there like bloody Stephen Hawking when I go to a shoe shop. And I've got to get size 11. But you see, that might be US 12. Could, that's what it could be. It could say US 12. So I've got to, is it 12 or 11? Uh, can I get a US 12, UK 11, please? I mean, welcome to hell. And then you've got the fresh hell of the European numbers. So my European number is sometimes 46, sometimes 45, sometimes 44. Eh? What? Disaster. Welcome to hell. Shoe sizing is horrible. And it's very unfortunate when you've got big feet. And I'll tell you for why, because... All shoes, in my opinion, all shoes look good when they're small. And in shops, the shoe on display is normally smaller. And I think it's because it looks better. And then when they bring us, you bring out this little, you know, you look at the shoe, you really like it. So you go to the person. Have you noticed how hard it is to get served in a shoe shop? It is the ultimate lottery, isn't it? Catch their eye, try and impress them with a winning smile. Look like you're desperate. And finally, you get there, you know, and if you go to one of the really big ones, they've got like a headset and they take the shoe and they say, uh, yeah, and they put the code in. If you, can you check in the warehouse if you've got this in size uh, size 11? And by the way, I find shoe shops generally notoriously understocked. Have you ever been to a shoe shop that just had all the sizes? They never do, do they? It's, it's a big lie. The promise that they've got all the sizes. They never fulfill that. Um, I have got... Um, you know, so anyway, what happens is that you've got this little shoe and it looks good. And then they bring you they bring you the size 11, which is my size. And it's disgusting. It's like a clog. So it's like a gigantic boot of a thing. It looked so good when it was little. And you've got this giant thing. Very ugly and very disgusting. And very disappointing. Um, sometimes they come out and they go, um, we don't have um, we, we haven't got the 11 in white, but we have got the 11 in this slightly different style in green. That's not great, is it? That wouldn't work in any other context. You go to a restaurant, you ask for a margarita pizza and they say, we don't have a margarita pizza on this occasion, but we will give you a chicken tikka masala. It's like, that's not even the same genre of food. Have you lost your mind? 
We've gone from Italy to Asia in one fell swoop. But they do that with shoes. They come out with a bunch of shoes that are a different color and a different style that you didn't want. You famously didn't ask for. And is that how low the bar is now? That you've got to go around wearing shoes that you don't like because that's all they had in that size? Thanks, but no thanks. How dare you? Um, look, we've we've uh, we've got, you know, so much to talk about on this show, but I'm going to have to wrap things up um, very, very shortly. Um, let me end with an inspirational message, which is from the brilliant band Pink Floyd, who achieved global success with their albums Dark Side of the Moon. And then there was the other one whose name escapes me, but it had uh, had that um, Hey Teacher, Leave Those Kids Alone song on it, which is absolutely brilliant. I mean, they are a great band, aren't they? I'm obviously, you might have been able to tell I'm not an expert on their on their body of work, but great artists, sold a lot of records. And I watched a great interview with Waters. Is it Roger Waters? What's he called? Let's have a quick look. I think it's worth that. I think it's worth uh, doing a bit of research here. Um, Pink Floyd um, band members. There you go. That will do it. Pink Floyd band members. Yes, Roger Waters. Um, Roger Waters is um, alongside Dave Gilmore, originally Sid Barrett, who sadly um, was no longer with us, but he left the band quite uh, early in his career because of issues with uh, drug abuse. We'll do a special on drugs very soon, by the way. Uh, Nick Mason as well. Um, a very, a very incredible band, Pink Floyd. Anyway, so they talked about their early career and they were innovators. Their music style was very different. In life, when you break the rules, when you are original, it's always harder to, to make it fly. It's always harder to be successful, to get it started. New stuff will always be rejected because there's a natural tendency within human nature to accept the status quo and to want to have things which are similar to what you already know. That's how the music industry works. It's how everything works. Every single creative output is based on mediocrity. And so, for example, let's say you're a musician now. If you go to a record company, let's say you're a budding musician with new material, they might look at you and go, well, well, he's a bit like Ed Sheeran. So that's good. So we'll say yes. And we'll give him a record deal because he's a bit like Ed Sheeran. Or they might say that lady is a bit like Beyonce and Beyonce is successful. So let's do that. But honestly, very, very often, normally those people will not be successful because it's just like more of the same. You're not going to make a splash where how you break the Internet, how you how you are absolutely just really, really successful is when you are original an original voice. But the problem is it takes longer to get it going. But once it gets going, it explodes and it becomes the biggest thing ever. So the Beatles were different to the kind of music that we'd had up till that point. I mean, yes, they were influenced by Elvis Presley and Buddy Holly and others, but it was a completely unique approach. It was the first time that a band were also the singer songwriters. They were from Liverpool's an English rock and roll band. You know, they broke the mold, they broke the rules and they changed the world. The comedian Ricky Gervais, a complete one off, you know, a revolutionary. The office was just no one had ever seen anything like that before. It was epoch defining. So it's always good to be different. It's always good to be original. And here's the challenge, um, which is to understand if you're if you're going to be an innovator, it's harder. In the last episode, I talked about the challenges that um Dyson, James Dyson had with his bagless vacuum cleaner. It's because it was a revolutionary idea. So it took longer to get off the ground. But once it once it broke, that was it. It became the thing. He's now a billionaire. Um, so I will leave you with two lovely sentences which sum up um, what the Pink Floyd band said in terms of their success. And it was the fact that it was so hard at the beginning for them to get acknowledged and to be successful. It was so hard. It was so, well, they were original and no one wanted their work. J.K. Rowling, the same thing, by the way, rejected, I think, by over 10 publishers. It's so hard for J.K. Rowling to get published with the Harry Potter. But once it took, once one publishing company took the leap, bang, changed the world. So what did Pink Floyd say? What did Roger Waters say in this interview about their success? He said, 
The struggle made it interesting. The struggle made it work. The struggle made it interesting. The struggle made it work. And that's my message to you today. Loved having your company. I'll see you on the next show. You can watch this show on YouTube and you can hear it on all podcast platforms. Please give us a review if you can, an honest review. And also please like and subscribe on YouTube because that will allow you to be alerted every time there's a new episode. And here's the thing, we do a weekly show, but we do occasional bonus episodes as well. And only you will find out about those if you are subscribed. Um, Have a brilliant day. Remember, live with imperfection, move on. It will change your life. See you next time.